So how is everybody today? All right, I'm, I'm extremely wired up, which I'm not used to, so nobody throw water or coffee at me or anything like that. So, <laughs> uh, My name is Chris Henry. I work at EAA in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. How many people have been to Oshkosh? All right, perfect. That's what I like to see. So, uh, We're going to talk a little bit about the B-17 Flying Fortress. Has anybody ever been out to see our aluminum overcast when it comes to visit? I think a lot of uh, the folks here have done a lot of work. Yeah, you're wearing the jacket, so obviously... <laughs> There's a good story I'll close with about that jacket, so uh, you'll, you'll enjoy that. Um, the photos that you're going to see here today, uh, it's worth talking about those. Uh, those are not, these are not published photos. These were photos that the veterans who flew with us shared with us. So there's a few in telling the story of the B-17 that you probably have seen before. But when we start talking about the veterans, uh, this is all from their private photo albums that they've allowed us to share with you guys. So uh, you're in for uh, sort of a treat. Has anybody seen this presentation before? Okay, good, good. No, uh, no repeat offenders then here today. So <laughs> yeah, nobody can say, well, here's the part where. So um, it is, but it's different. I've, uh, we, yeah, we, Believe it or not, you know, it's a changing presentation. Um, I started doing this um, 2013, and how this came to be was we flew our B-17 for years. And I think it's something that we just, we enjoyed, we loved, we, we enjoyed seeing these veterans, but we weren't always keeping track of who we had on board and why we had them on board. So when you buy a flight on our airplane now, one of the questions is, what made you want to fly on this airplane? It's $449 for the flight. Um, that's not a cheap investment. So something has to make you want to go do it. And sometimes it's people that just say, well, uh, I've just always loved it, so I wanted to go do it. But other times, there's a pretty cool story, and I'm glad that we started asking it. So first, we'll talk about the B-17 and how it got its name. That's one of the questions we always get. How did it get the name Flying Fortress? Well, you've got to go back to 1935. 1935, well, what was going on in the country? The Great Depression. Um, the United States Army Air Corps asked for a competition to be held at Wright Field, which is out in Dayton, Ohio. If you've been to the Air Force Museum, uh, right behind the Air Force Museum is where, where the runway was. And they wanted to make a new bomber. And this bomber was going to have significant range and be able to carry a decent uh, bomb load. And with the Great Depression on, a lot of these companies were very, very hesitant to get involved in this contract because you know, they said the, Air, the Air Corps is going to build you know, 20, 30 of these airplanes, and that's it. Uh, they didn't have a lot of free money, and they would rather spend their money on airliners and stuff that you know, could at least get more orders. Boeing sort of saw the light and they said this is going to be a big deal and they really gambled the future of the company, pulled a lot of funds together to build one airplane called the Boeing Model 299 and that's it right there coming out of the hangar in 1935. Now the, the most technologically advanced airliner at the time is sitting right next to it, that's a Boeing 247, that actually predates the DC-3. and. You know, you got to remember that the, the, the airliners of the time were a Ford tri-motor, and a lot of the airplanes that were fighters were fabric-controlled, so, or, or fabric-covered. So suddenly, here comes this four-engine metal bomber bristling with about 10 50 caliber machine guns. Nobody had ever seen anything like that. And there was a Seattle Times reporter standing there, and he said, my god, it's a flying fortress. And there was a gentleman from Boeing standing next to him that heard it, and he immediately went and told everybody about it, and they trademarked it. And uh, that became the Flying Fortress uh, name. Everybody saw an airplane that big and they said there's no way it's going to be able to perform up to military standards. It was just so gigantic for that time. There were a few uh, test airplanes prior to that, like the B-15, that were actually bigger, but they really, really suffered for in performance. Well, suddenly the 299 comes out and actually starts breaking speed and altitude records of fighters from that time period. And everybody's mind was kind of blown that, wow, this massive airplane is actually cleaning up. On the way to uh, Dayton 
for the evaluation that was going to be held. It broke another uh, record, a speed record. So everybody at this competition pretty much felt that this was a, a clear win for Boeing. The other companies that, had, that went into this competition took existing airplanes and just kind of modified them uh, into a bomber configuration. Uh, and we'll get into that in a little bit here. You can see the glorious uh, B-18. But uh, it looked like it was gonna be a clear victory for Boeing. Uh, their first flight went good. Uh, the second flight, they, in the excitement, forgot to take the gust locks off the airplane. And they didn't have checklists then. This event is actually what led to the checklist that you use every day in a cockpit. Uh, they took off and stalled off the end of the runway and crashed. Uh, the, both pilots were killed. A couple people that were in the back were able to get out. But the prototype, the only Boeing prototype, was lost. And the Air Corps said, we can't very well award a contract to some people who just balled up their airplane at the end of our runway. Uh, so all the orders went to the uh, Douglas company who built the just really glamorous and beautiful B-18. And uh, you can see what a, what, what a looker that is. But um, you can also see what Douglas did. They took a lot of DC-3 uh, parts in there and uh, just sort of modified the fuselage and made a bomber out of it. Uh, thank God none of these saw combat. These were all relegated to stateside training for bombardiers, navigators, uh, things like that. So these actually never actually saw combat, except for a few that were at Pearl Harbor that pretty much got wiped out. Boeing found a way through a loophole to order 13, what was now designated the YB-17, and that's exactly what they did. And the Air Corps ordered, or I'm sorry, the Air Corps ordered these aircraft. And uh, immediately, because of their range, you have to remember at this time period, the Army and the Navy were sort of battling over who was gonna be the protector of the United States and who had that, that, that title. They started pulling off some pretty significant stunts uh, where they would show off their range, navigation, precision bombing, and on one occasion, they actually went out and intercepted a, a cruise ship way out at sea just to show off to the Navy that they could go out and hit targets at sea. The navigator on one of those uh, B-17s that did that was a gentleman by the name of Curtis LeMay, and uh, he would go on to some pretty big things in the Strategic Air Command, of course. But uh, the first era B-17s to see combat were under Lend-Lease, and they were called Fortress Ones. We were given to the Royal Air Force, and the uh, immediate reports that came back were it's a good airplane, but it needs even more armament and uh, some combat improvements. And uh, of course, they went to the B-17E, which is what we pretty much know as the B-17. Now this sort of starts to get into the veteran aspect of it. Um, when I started the EAA, we started onto the form of, of what made you want to fly on the B-17. And the reports that came back were just incredible. I expected, you know, so, some people that may say they had a veteran in their family or something like that. Um, and what we started getting was, well, my grandfather flew on a B-17 and I want to go sit where he sat. Uh, or my father is a B-17 crew member and we want to buy him one last flight. And uh, it was really sort of touching. I mean, it was very touching. Um, and as we started talking more about it, it was fun to find people who didn't know anything about their loved one's service other than they were on a B-17. And we would get their name and with a little research, find a crew photo or a photo of them during World War II from the bomb group associations that are out there. And we would reply back and I, I love doing this still to this day, we reply back with, you know, you're all set to go fly in, in you know, Cincinnati, Ohio on the 10 o'clock flight, and here's a picture of your grandfather that you've never seen. And the, re the replies just started pouring in at that point where, you know, people were like, oh my gosh, where did you find this? And, you know, we would give them more information of, you know, well, he was in the 341st bomb group or, you know, whatever information we would find out. Uh, and that's sort of where it started kicking off, where there were veterans who did know, there were families that did know their histories, uh, and they would start sharing the photo albums with us. Uh, when I was a kid, my next door neighbor uh, was a PBJ pilot, and uh, it was a Marine Corps B-25. And uh, I'll never forget his uh, family, when he passed away, his family had his scrapbook and just didn't think anybody would want it and was gonna throw it away. And uh, because it was just a bunch of pictures of airplanes and guys that they didn't know. And, and uh, you know, it was like, my gosh, no, we have to save that. And uh, there's a lot still happening like that. So it's amazing to help get to preserve this for these, uh, these folks. A lot of families have this stuff and they just don't know who was interested in it and what to do with it. 
But once we start cracking open these scrapbooks and these, these photo albums, uh, the photos that come out of it and the stories that come out of it are amazing. We all know the famous guys from World War II. And what I love about uh, what we get to do is we sort of make uh, maybe some of the names that you've never heard of, give them their story, uh, their time to, to shine here. Uh, the first B-17Es flew into uh, their new assigned base in Hawaii at Pearl Harbor, December 7th of 1941. They flew into Pearl World War II that morning. Uh, they had guns on board, but they were all uh, brand new guns in crates. They had no ammunition and low fuel, so they really had nowhere else to go. One of the gentlemen that we talked to, uh, who was just uh, from Appleton, Wisconsin, actually was telling us that uh, uh, he was flying a B-17 into Pearl Harbor that morning. And he said, we saw uh, what looked like a bunch of birds or something. And he said, then we got closer and we, we said, well, it's, it's fighters. It must be the Navy trying to show off because we're coming in. And he said, then one of them came up and shot out my number three engine. And he says, well, this isn't the Navy. <laughs> and uh, so uh, he actually belly landed his plane on a golf course. And then uh, they hid out until the, uh, uh, the, the, the bombing had stopped before they, they cleared out and got out of the, the small wooded area they were in. Ed Hudson was assigned to a B-17 group. He was a gunner, and he was shipped to Pearl Harbor ahead of his, his squadron. And uh, that morning, he was, he, as the guy woke, one of his bunkmates woke him up and said, we're being bombed. And he said, I thought it was just kind of a drill or something. I rolled over to go back to sleep, and then I, started, I could hear explosions. And uh, he said, so we ran outside, and uh, they were shooting at the airplanes with pistols and shotguns. And uh, he said, somebody knew where there was a 50 caliber machine gun, so they went to get one of those. And I knew where the ammunition was. So I ran into a building, and I grabbed two cans. Ammunition comes in these big cans. I'm sure you probably have seen those. And uh, he said he grabbed two cans of ammunition, turned toward the door, and then blacked out. And he said when he came to, uh, there were guys lifting a wall off of him. Uh, a bomb had hit the building that he was in. And the only thing that saved his life is when the wall came down, the two cans of ammunition pried the wall up off of him enough that he was able to survive. Uh, he would go on to uh, fly B-17s in the Pacific, uh, as a, oh, fly in them. He was a ball turret gunner, which uh, the ball sticks out of the, underneath the B-17. Uh, and a, you're sort of in a round sphere with twin 50 caliber machine guns, and you defend the belly of the airplane. Uh, he was kind of rare because he had both Japanese and German kills. And when the B-17s went to Europe, he transferred over to there and, and flew in both theaters. So that's kind of a, a rare thing. The B-17 was the first Allied bomber to drop bombs uh, in World War II. Uh, immediately, uh, starting December 8th and 9th, uh, B-17s took off and would start hunting uh, targets wherever they could find ships, uh, wherever they can get to. Uh, of course, uh, we fought with what we had. I mean, they were using some outdated airplanes at that time. A lot of people forget that when Pearl Harbor was bombed, there were fabric control or fabric covered biplanes that were frontline airplanes that were destroyed at Pearl. So, I mean, that was where our, our nation was. Uh, the German Air Force in one air show put up more airplanes than we had in our entire inventory in the United States. So we were now up against a, a war with Germany and Japan. And a lot of people think, thought that we couldn't win. Uh, of course, uh, Doolittle and his boys uh, sort of started to turn the tide there when they bombed Tokyo. Major Eugene Benedetti, he was in the 19th bomb group, and he was 19 years old, and he was a B-17 pilot. Uh, I couldn't even imagine that. 19 years old, I, I wasn't doing anything that cool when I was 19 years old. And uh, he was flying an E model out in the Pacific. And throughout this program, where, you know, you'll hear about heroism and, uh, and leadership. And uh, these guys uh, of that generation, the men and women of that generation, just are, are glowing examples of that. Major Benedetti's uh, airplane was attacked by three zeros. And in the process, uh, shells had come through the cockpit, killing his co-pilot. And they struck him in the back of the head. And he lost a vision in his right eye and was shot in the back. And uh, the, everybody was busy. All the gunners were busy, and the intercom was shot out. So for a half hour, he flew that airplane still in great pain until the flight engineer, top turret gunner, came down to see what was going on and, and saw the, the scene that he did. Uh, even after they jabbed him with morphine, uh, he refused to leave his seat. 
and uh, the top turret gunner helped land the airplane back at base where they, where they did get back safely. Uh, it wasn't until uh, 70 years later that he was awarded the Silver Star for his actions that day. Uh, he was uh, upward, he was, I think, 90 at the time. The uh, Bloody Yanks arrive in England. Um, that was what we were called over there, the Bloody Yanks. And uh, the big thing we were going to do different was the Royal Air Force had been bombing at night. They were using airplanes like the Avro Lancaster and some of the others, the Mosquito. And they would go to where they thought this target was at night, and they would drop their bombs and hope to hit it. Uh, we were going to do something a little bit different. We were going to go in the daytime, and we had something called the Norden Bomb Site, which was the biggest secret of World War II. And it was such a big secret that the, the crew members had to take an oath, the bombardiers had to actually take an oath uh, to destroy that bomb site if anything would ever happen to the airplane. And uh, the, they took such an oath, actually, that uh, they, were carried, they carried a sidearm, and if, if they were to bail out, they had to destroy that bomb site before they could bail out. Um, but we were going to go in the daytime. This would allow us to hit pinpoint strategic targets, bridges, railroad junctions, factories, and hope to put our bombs right on the target. Uh, the good thing was we could see them, and the bad thing was they could see us. Uh, the two main things that you had to worry about as a B-17 crew member, or bomber crew member for that matter, uh, was flak or anti-aircraft fire. It was an 88 shell that was timed to go off at a certain altitude, and it would blow up and it'd be a big black puff of smoke and then it would throw shrapnel around the sky and hopefully puncture, you know, they would hope to hope, they would hope to puncture the airplane, engines, crew, anything it could. Um, the other thing was the fighters and uh, there was no shortage of those in Germany, especially in the early years. If you've seen our airplane, have aluminum overcast, you may wonder why it's painted that way. Well, it's painted that way because of a gentleman named Hal Weekly. Anybody ever meet Hal? Hal Weekly is the gentleman standing in the top left, and uh, he, was a, he was a tall guy, and uh, he flew in the 398th Bomb Group, and he flew what is basically the original aluminum overcast. Uh, that our airplane is in his markings because uh, he was such a spearhead and a spark plug for our B-17 program. From the time it came in and started the restoration to the time it started the tour around the country, uh, so, as a tribute to him, uh, we painted the airplane in his markings. Funny story about Hal was that uh, uh, he was shot down on a mission, and it took about three weeks to get him back and his crew back to the base. Well, he said, you only had about three days. If you didn't show up from a mission, and after about three days, they would start going through your clean socks and everything else and, and sharing them among uh, the gang there. And he said, so when we got back, we figured our stuff was long gone. And we get back, and nothing has been touched. And uh, he asked the guys, he said, how come you didn't mess with our stuff? And he, they said, uh, you're too big of a guy. We were afraid you might still be alive. So uh, <laughs> Captain Ed Stevens, uh, I understand when you get an airplane named after your wife, or your girlfriend back home, I think that's pretty cool. Some of them, you have to wonder what the story is behind him. Uh, this airplane was named the Fish and Chips Special. And uh, he was an ambulance driver and a paramedic prior to the war. Um, he got his private pilot's license, and when the war broke out, he asked to learn to fly B-17s, specifically he wanted to fly the, the Fortress. And he uh, was on a mission, he was only 21 years old, and he was on a mission uh, just about to cross the enemy coast when the airplane was hit multiple times by flak. And actually wounded everybody on board except for him, he was the only one not hit. And a couple of them had parachutes that had been damaged, they couldn't bail out. And they told him, you know, you're a young guy, get out of here, you know, bail out, save yourself, and we'll try to ditch the airplane in the ocean. And uh, he, uh, he actually came on the intercom and told them all to shut up, is what he, is what he said. And uh, he descended the airplane to 50 feet above the water, uh, thinking that that way no German airplanes could dive on him. And uh, they, he nursed this airplane on two engines all the way back to a base that he could, you know, an airstrip he could find to land on. And uh, on the short final, he lost another engine. So he uh, was able to touch down on one engine. And you can see he couldn't keep it on the runway with just the one engine. And so he kind of went and departed the runway there a bit. Um, but you know, the thing that I think stands out the most is there he is there. He gets out of the airplane. And instead of worrying about himself, he immediately starts giving first aid to his crew. And uh, I think that really uh, strikes home 
to that, not only that generation, but it was like on that crew. Uh, all the veterans I talked to said that they, they stuck together as a crew and they didn't really become friends with anybody else. They said it was just too tough, you know, to, to start losing, losing buddies. Um, I've interviewed a lot of these guys, and just last week I had one that uh, really just struck a nerve. I asked him a, a question about friends over there, and he said, uh, you know, no. He was in the early part of the war, and I said, uh, were you scared? He says, on my first mission I was, but that was because I was foolish. And I said, well, what did you mean? And he said, I still thought that I had a chance on my first mission. And he said, I came back, and somebody told me just to, you know, accept that you're dead and you'll be fine. And he said, that's a tough pill to swallow when you're 20 years old, you know. And uh, it, was, it was pretty touching uh, to hear him, you know, talk about just what it was like to concentrate on the job. So another role that I do at EAA is when we bring the airplane into different airports, um, what we like to do is find some vets that, uh, that maybe have flown the B-17 or helped build the B-17s or have some tie to it. Uh, family members even maybe, and then we try to put them on the media flight, we take them with us on a media flight. We actually save a seat or two uh, going into different airports specifically for this purpose. We like to find a vet that, you know, maybe this gentleman can't afford $449, so it let's, let's take him up with us and, and do the right thing by getting him up with us. Um, we, we had Pat Patterson uh, come out to fly with us. He was a pilot in the 388th Bomb Group. And uh, nobody told him that day that he wasn't actually flying the left seat. Uh, so when we went to put him in the airplane, he just muscle memory crawled right back up into his old seat and was ready to go. So we had to break it to him gently. He was going to sit right behind the pilot. So, um, but he had a he had he had a funny story or a cool story and a uh, not cool story, uh, not, a good story and a bad story, I guess. Um, the, the fun story was is that one day he went out on a mission and they were getting ready to go. And they said, hey, we're going to throw this guy in the back to take some pictures and do a story. And he said, sure, that's fine. And uh, he said it was years later that I found out that that was Andy Rooney from 60 Minutes that uh, was flying with us. He was with Stars and Stripes at the time. Uh, the, the other story was is that uh, their airplane was down for repairs. Uh, so they had the, the, this mission off. And his ball turret gunner said that there was another ball turret gunner uh, who had been sick on another airplane, and he asked, would it be okay if I went with them and filled in? And he said, yeah, I don't mind. And he said, we all kind of made some jokes that uh, he was going to get his missions in first and go home and steal our girlfriends, you know. And so uh, he said that they, he went on the flight, and he said, you know, in the afternoon you would go out when you knew the bombers were coming in. It was called sweating out the mission. You'd go out there and stand near the flight line and Everybody would sit around and watch everybody coming in to see who made it and who didn't. And he said, the whole time we're watching these planes come in, there's one B-17 off in the distance circling. And he says, we couldn't figure out what they were doing. And uh, somebody came down and told us, that's the airplane with your gunner on it. Uh, he's stuck in the turret, and the gear won't come down on the airplane. And uh, he said, we sat out there watching. He said, they had a fuel leak they were trying to fix to try to get more time. And finally, they, uh, they had to come in and belly land in, on the airplane. And of course, on a 17, the ball turret doesn't go up. As a matter of fact, it's the first thing that hits. So uh, that gentleman lost his life that day. And uh, uh, Pat said that uh, there's not a day that goes by that I don't wake up and, and, and think about that guy. And just one simple decision you know, changed uh, the course of a fate for that guy. Uh, Lieutenant Rob Mahar turned 20 in England. And his mother sent him a brand new camera, and she said, take some pretty pictures of Europe for me. Uh, so he took it up with him and started taking pictures of any aircraft fire that was coming up at them. I, I don't think uh, that's what she meant. But uh, we're talking about flak. Those are, that's flak all going off around that airplane. And uh, one of the cool things we did, uh, you'll hear me talk about magic a little bit today with this airplane. Uh, there's just things that happen beyond our control with this, this plane, which is truly amazing. Uh, that, that P-51 escort fighter there uh, pulled up next to him on one of their missions. That was their escort. And uh, Rob wanted to check out or test out his new camera. So he said, pull in close, I'll take a picture of you. And he snapped that photo. Uh, they did not know each other, and they never met after. Uh, when the family shared these pictures with us prior to his flight, uh, we did a little research and found out that the guy that flew that Mustang was still alive and about an hour and a half from where Rob was going to fly. 
Uh, so we put both of them in the radio room and put that picture up in the radio room and uh, started it up and went, took them for her flight. And at first they were arguing about who took the picture and what the background was on the picture. And then they sort of realized like, oh my God, you know, this, that, I remember that day and uh, put them two together right in the airplane. So um, once again, something we couldn't have even planned if we wanted to. Of course, today we talk about the, the men who crewed this airplane and, uh, and the brave men who took it into combat, and, and you can't talk about the B-17 without that. But we also have to talk about the women of World War II. Uh, they performed some pretty heroic roles as well. The one thing to remember during World War II is that everybody fought World War II. Uh, of course, uh, the, the folks who were on the front lines and fighting in combat did, but the home front rallied behind it too, completely. You had things like victory gardens and, and, and rations on different, uh, you know, gasoline and metal. Uh, it was just a, a united front. Uh, we outproduced just about every uh, country out there. Uh, we had a, a famous quote that we had heard once was uh, a German tank commander was touring a museum and was looking at a Sherman tank and he says, you know, the German Panzer tank was as good as 10 of your American Sherman tanks. And he goes, but the problem is, is you Yanks always had 11. And uh, so it was, it was very true. And, you know, women, you know, you look at aluminum overcast, remember that women built that airplane. Uh, it's amazing when we start to take some of the wing panels or parts of the airplane off that are original from World War II uh, for maintenance. And you can actually see notes from Rosie the Riveters and stuff under the skins of the airplane. So uh, it really is pretty uh, amazing. Blanche Barnes is one of those women. Uh, she joined up the American Red Cross and went over to Europe, and she drove what I would imagine would be an ice cream truck for pilots. Uh, it was a truck driven by pretty girls that played swing music and gave out donuts. So uh, I imagine that that would be pretty popular at airports even today. Um, but uh, she, when you see these movies and you see the, the map come down with the red line on it and everything, that briefing was for officers. That was for bombardiers, navigators, pilots, co-pilots. The enlisted men, the gunners, would just go out to the airplane and they would start making sure the bombs were loaded right, that their guns were all ready to go, and, and they had the right ammunition. Sometimes they would steal or sneak extra ammunition or extra flak jackets to try to make a, uh, some armor plating in their little area. And Blanche said she always enjoyed spending time with the enlisted men out at the airplane because they had a little bit more time to kill. And she said, I never thought that the donuts that we were handing out um, that was probably the last thing some of those guys ever had to eat because they were going on a mission and they didn't come back. Uh, so she said, I'd really spend a lot of time with them. We'd dance and listen to the music out there and they were always happy to see an American girl. So we wanted to do something cool. And in a little overcast, we, you know, B-17s are cool. You can bring any B-17 or any World War II airplane in and it's gonna be a hit. It's gonna be neat to look at. The thing we try to do with the overcast is not make it about that airplane. It's about the people. Uh, that flew them, that designed them, that crewed them. That's what we want to make our experience about. Uh, so we were trying to figure out a way to do something neat for Blanche. We couldn't really figure anything out. And I came up with the idea. I said, what if we just, it's really simple, but what if we just went and bought some boxes of donuts and we decorated the boxes with her pictures from World War II? Uh, so we did that and we surprised her that morning. And she went right back into her routine and she grabbed the boxes of donuts and she started serving the other World War II veterans that were out there that morning. So it was something simple. I mean, we probably spent $5 in boxes of donuts, but it was something that made that flight a little bit more memorable for her and her family. How many here have heard of Rosie the Riveter? This is exactly how I picture Rosie the Riveter. June, June Smokey Morris. Uh, she worked the night shift on the assembly line in Seattle on B-17s. Her job was the last job on the assembly line. She would seal up the wing and the airplane would get rolled out, fueled, and go test flown and then off to a base it would go. Uh, she worked night shift. She was home one morning and uh, her, she got the telegram that her father had been killed. He was a merchant marine and his ship was sunk by a German U-boat. And remember, I talked about how the home front fought the, the war in their, uh, their own terms. And uh, Boeing had also told her not to come to work that night. There was actually a, some sort of a labor dispute. And they said, there's a picket line. Don't come in tonight. We're going to figure it all out, and we'll, we'll, you can come back later. Uh, that night, she went to work. And she crossed the picket line. And she said, this isn't about anything. This is, about, uh, this is how I'm fighting the war. I'm getting revenge for my father. Uh, her bucker, uh, named Helen, because it took two to drive the rivets, 
uh, crossed the line with her. And uh, together that night, the two of them finished out their B-17 alone. And the next morning, that airplane rolled out of the assembly line, line ready to go. Uh, that was how she was going to fight World War II. Now, June had built thousands of B-17s in Seattle, but she'd never flown in one. So we changed that. And uh, we took her up in her B-17, as uh, she was calling it that day. So it's pretty neat. Of course, this is a great day out at the airplane. Reporters came out to, to interview her. And I really think reporters thought they were going to come and stick a mic in her face, get what they wanted, and then head out. And instead, June, who was just, just tough as nails, uh, takes them under the wing and gives them about a half-hour dissertation on rivets. And, and, and uh, so she held a mini sportier workshop, I guess, right under the wing of the airplane. So, and what was funny was they sent us all the tall guys, I think, that day. I mean, they were these six-foot-tall, six-foot-one, and they're all sort of hunched over at these weird angles trying to get a microphone in her face. It was really funny, but she didn't let them go for a good half hour. Uh, some of the ones that we try to, to, to plan come together, some of the cool memories. Uh, this is one that in a million years I would have never been able to put together. Uh, Faith Goldman called me and told me that her husband uh, was in the end stages of, of his life. Uh, they knew that. They had been battling cancer for, for a few years. Um, and his sort of last wish was he wanted to fly on a B-17. Um, she sa I asked him why the, B her, why the B-17 and and she said, well, uh, he is a, uh, a Holocaust survivor. And I said, okay, you know, wow, that, that, that in itself is pretty amazing. But I still couldn't put the tie to the B-17. What, what made that something you wanted to do? And they said, well, American GIs liberated the camp. And they had no idea what this thing was. They, they, they didn't know what to do. Nobody knew what to do. So they just kind of kept calling around looking for somebody to give them some guidance of what should they be doing. And word got to the 306 bomb group. And the 306 bomb group took a, a B-17 and they loaded it full of food in the bomb bay. And then they flew over. And when they got to the camp, they opened the bomb bay doors and all the food just kind of rained down into the concentration camp. And they said it was crude, but it was the best that they could do on short notice, you know. But at least they were getting them some food. And she said, you know, he was in that camp surrounded by death. And he knew he was going to die. He had, he had accepted that. And then suddenly here comes this beautiful bomber with stars on the wings and it starts raining food. And she's like, so that's what he wants to do. And I'm like, wow, okay. Um, this was early on in my career. This was before I was really working on media flights. And uh, she asked me the price. I told her and she said, wow, that's just, you know, we just can't afford it. And so I took her number down and I said, well, let me see what we can do. And I, I don't mean to sound like a commercial for EAA, but EAA does some pretty cool stuff. And I said, let me... Let me just explore any avenues here. About an hour later, a gentleman calls, and he said, I flew on your airplane last year. I loved it, and I just want to donate a seat, two seats to anybody who, who deserves to go who has a story. And I said, well, well, here's the story that I just got about an hour ago. And he said, that's perfect. And he goes, that's the one that, yes, let's do this. So um, that all sounds amazing, and that sounds like that would be the end of this, this story and we would be moving to the next slide, and it's not. Uh, about a day later, we have this media flight, or I'm sorry, this flight set up, and about a day later, a gentleman calls to buy a flight for his father, and he said, uh, my dad flew a B-17 named Pandemonium Reigns in the 306 bomb group, and he said he flew uh, 35 missions. Uh, he says, but he won't really talk about them, and I, I said, well, yeah, that happens. He goes, well, the one he will talk about is the day he went out and he bombed a concentration camp with food, and I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. So we put them together in a radio room, and uh, we, uh, right before engines start, we introduced everybody to each other to let them know who they were. And uh, nobody left the radio room for that flight. Uh, everybody had pretty much sat in the radio room and cried the entire flight, and, uh, including the crew. <laughs> so the crew of Miss Liberty Bell uh, had flown 68 missions. And this is a great example of how we're able to span oceans with this airplane without ever leaving Oshkosh sometimes. Uh, on their final mission, they were coming in with two engines. Everybody was okay on board. And uh, another B-17 started firing flares, which meant wounded aboard. Uh, this B-17, uh, they, they let it cut in front of them to get the wounded guys down first. And the crew of Miss Liberty Bell opted to go around, even on two engines, which is a pretty brave move. Unfortunately, on the go-around, they lost a third engine. B-17 on one engine, you're not really going anywhere. 
And uh, they were coming down right into the town of Chelliston, England, which was where they were based. And you know, these guys had become friends with these people. They just certainly didn't want to crash into their town. Uh, the pilot uh, tried to restart one of the bad engines. Uh, he input uh, full power onto the good engine and stood the airplane up almost on one wing, going around the town and then stalling and crashing on the outskirts of the town. Um, eight of the 10 on board were killed. The villagers came out and actually drugged the other two out. The, the survivors were, were saved by the civilians of the town. To this day, there is a memorial on the site of where this airplane crashed, thanking the men of the United States Army Air Force for, for their sacrifice for their town. Uh, every day on August 3rd, which is when the crash occurred, it was August 3rd in 1943, uh, they uh, have a sort of a, a town party, if you will, or, or festival um, to honor that crew. Uh, August 3rd of 2013, uh, we had had it set up where they sent us a flag that had flown over the crash site as well as pieces of the real Miss Liberty Bell. And uh, during Air Venture of 2013, we flew those overhead and had let Miss Liberty Bell fly one more time. We took a live stream of that and shared it with the folks in England. And they were able to sort of watch it for their evening uh, programming over there that uh, some pieces of their aer the, the airplane over there were, were flying again. So built Boeing tough. That sounds like a commercial for 737s. Uh, but uh, the, the airplane truly uh, it wasn't amazing. It was overbuilt. Um, this B-17 was named Mitzpah, and uh, you can see the nose is actually completely gone. Uh, that airplane took a direct flak hit, and uh, the bombardier and navigator were lost. The pilots are actually still flying the airplane at this point. Uh, they were able to keep it wings level long enough to get the crew time to bail out, and uh, as a testament to that, the daughter of the pilot uh, came out to fly with us, and she shared that picture with us. Uh, the picture in the top left, or top, sorry, top right, uh, was a 306 B-17 that came back uh, with no, hor no vertical and half the horizontals are shredded. And uh, just uh, amazing that this airplane continued to fly home that way. My favorite one is the picture on the top left though. Those guys were on a, a final for their runway on two engines. Uh, one of the other engines died. And uh, they said, well, number three is still running okay and it'll get us back. And they landed and as they rolled out, uh, as they stopped, uh, the number three engine fell off the airplane. And uh, that's uh, them back at base trying to figure out them. I think the ground crew is probably trying to figure out how to put it back on at this point. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, a lot of these guys that, that came, they would say that the airplane would just give you everything it got. You know, and it, a lot of times it, the thing would just, you know, the thing would just die once it got home, but it would get you there. Some of these, we know that when we get these stories that we want to go out and we want to educate younger generations with this. Um, so we have to be extremely careful. We have to fact check a lot of things. Um, I also, my office is next door to a guy who is a big B-24 fan, uh, so if you could believe that. And uh, so uh, when I get a cool B-17 story, he right away tries to fact check me because he's a B-24 fan. If you want to see two older guys get into a fight, you just put a B-17 and a B-24 guy in the same room and they'll start arguing about which is better. Uh, but George Freetag's story is one of the ones that I had to double check because it was, it was pretty fascinating. It also tells us of why young men fight wars. Uh, George was a top turret gunner on a B-17. And right, uh, the top turret gunner sort of looked or was next to the bomb bay. If you've ever been to B-17, you have to walk through that catwalk uh, over the bomb bay. And that goes into the radio room. His best friend was the radio operator, so he'd be back in there. Uh, on a, one of their missions, they were hit, direct flak hit in the bomb bay. And what, they swear that one of the bombs could have possibly exploded. They don't know, but it was a pretty massive hit. And it, uh, the pilot wrote in a logbook that it loosened the left wing and the catwalk uh, was all twisted and the radio room was on fire. George could see it. Uh, so he made his way through this twisted catwalk to go see his, his buddy to make sure he was okay. And he got back there, he put the fire out. His friend was wounded, but he was okay. He, was, he wasn't life-threatening. Uh, the problem was that they had lost it, uh, two engines in this process, and the pilot was hitting the alarm bell. There was a school bell almost uh, in the airplane you would hit and would tell the crew to bail out. Uh, it was at this point that George noticed uh, that his friend's parachute was damaged, and uh, he couldn't bail out. And uh, George said, I'll never forget. To he, he looked up at me, and he said, uh, you've got to go. And he says, I'm going to ride it down. 
And uh, George says, I was ticked. You know, this is my buddy. We're in our young, early 20s. And uh, he said, so I, I stood up, I took my parachute off, and I threw it out the window. And I figured, if you're not going to go, I'm not going to go. So I don't think anybody thought about the pilot. The pilot now has two guys that can't bail out. And he said, uh, well, I can't leave you. He goes, so well, let's try to nurse it back to England. And they dropped out of formation. And uh, on their way back to, uh, back to base, they were escorted by a couple Mustangs. And uh, he said, uh, we nursed it back. And uh, they had the hand crank. Everything was just severely damaged on this airplane. Uh, they hand cranked the landing gear down, only to discover that both wheels had been hit. So they had flat tires. They had no brakes, uh, no flaps. Uh, the Bombay doors wouldn't raise, they were sheared in half. Uh, the, uh, 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 two of the engines were out and there was something else missing from the airplane. It was completely shot off the airplane. I can't remember what it was. And he said, so we had a plan that we were going to take a couple of the parachutes because the guys all decided to stay together. Nobody bailed. And he said, uh, we tied the parachutes to the waste guns. And when we landed, we deployed the parachutes and that's what stopped us from rolling off the end of the runway. We used that. So, now here comes the story that I had to fact check. Um, when an airplane would come back this damaged, they would do something called, they, they would cannibalize it. They would take all the good parts off to keep the, the good planes flying. They would take the rest of the scrapyard. Um, the maintenance officer sent a note to the commanding officer who said there's not a damn thing worth saving on this airplane. So, it was sort of a big hobby. If an airplane came back really damaged, they'd go down and start counting the holes. They stopped counting at over, just over 32,000 holes in this airplane. Uh, I'm not even sure how long that would take to count the 32,000 holes. Um, and it was, a, you know, I'm a B-17 nut, so when I heard that, I immediately believed it. My B-24 buddy was like, no way. Um, so we started checking, and we asked uh, Maxwell Air Force Base if they can confirm the story. And they said, you need to check with Warner Robins Air Force Base. So we, we called Warner Robins Air Force Base, and not only did they send us images of the original paperwork, uh, they have a memorial to this airplane at Warner Robins in Georgia. It's, it holds a record for the most combat damaged airplane to ever return from a mission. Uh, so it was a pretty, uh, that's the only photo they know that they have of it for sure, but uh, pretty, uh, pretty incredible. So 32, yeah, yeah, they actually documented 30, and I don't know if they just got tired and stopped counting or how that, but yeah, if you go to the, there's actually a museum down there, the Museum of Aviation down at Warner Robins. If you go down there, there's actually a whole storyboard on that airplane. So it's pretty, uh, pretty incredible. Uh, one of the other cool things I get to do is help uh, maybe give uh, families a little bit of uh, closure, a little bit of education about some things. Uh, Todd Towton, who was Bill Towton's son, had this photo on the, on the left, a pretty classic photo of his father. And he said, I also had these love letters that my mom and dad had wrote back and forth to each other. And he says, in one of them, it says something about that he had taken damage, uh, but he nursed his airplane home, and I always wondered what that looked like. Well, we found that photo. Uh, that was a flak burst that went off under the left wing and tw just tore up the wing. And my favorite part of that photo isn't necessarily the damage. You know, it's the cocky 22-year-old leaning on the airplane, showing off what he brought, brought home there. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Sergeant Harvin Abrahamson was out of... Um, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and uh, he had a couple funny, well, he had two interesting stories, uh, one of which was that a, a bomb hung up in the bomb bay and wouldn't release, and the front part of it did, but the back didn't, so it was hanging, and he said we couldn't land that way, and uh, he said, so I knew I was in trouble because the top turret gunner and the bombardier had this big sort of stick with a hook on it, and they were pointing at me, and he says, oh boy, this is going to be a bad day. And what they convinced him to do, if you've ever been in that catwalk, there's ropes on each side. Well, during the war, those ropes weren't there. That's something that's aftermarket for the, for the warbird uh, tours. Um, he said, I walked out on that catwalk, and they held me by the back of my jacket and leaned me out over the bo open bomb bay so I can release that other bomb. And he, I said, what did you think about it? And he said, I, I, the only thing I could think of is if my mother saw this, she'd be really upset with me right now. <laughs> so, but the other story he had was we talked about those 88 shells. And he had uh, one come through the belly of the airplane, uh, into the radio room, through his table that he was sitting at, and lodge itself in top of the radio room. And it's just sticking out of the, the roof of this radio room that he was in. And um, he said, I don't know why it didn't go off. 
uh, but it didn't, and I wasn't going to ask it any questions. And he says, but the whole, the next six hours, we had to fly home with this shell sticking out of the radio room. And he says, we get home, and they, the armament guys came and removed it from the airplane. And they did whatever they did to it, but they took it apart. And they found that where there should have been the head that would go off to, to throw the shrapnel, there was a note. And the note said, the Germans are using slave labor. We're trying to do our part for you. <laughs> and uh, so they were sabotaging the shells that were going out. Um, one of the uh, B-17s, uh, Sweet Pea on the left, we flew one of the pilots. Uh, that airplane took a direct hit and flew home held together by the floorboards. And uh, when they landed, there just happened to be a Boeing tech rep there who they uh, said, you've got to come over and see this. That's actually him looking through the, through the airplane. And dynamite on the right flew some secret night missions. Uh, but everybody took turns flying on this airplane, and it never lost a crew member. And, but the airplane just became so damaged that it was repair after repair after repair. And finally, they just couldn't keep repairing this airplane. And they said that when they towed it to the boneyard, to the scrapyard, that like a big funeral procession, everybody who had ever flown on an airplane followed this thing down to the boneyard because they were sad to see it leave the group. So where did they all go? They built just shy of 13,000 B-17s. Today, all told, flying and static, there's 51 airframes left. Um, that's, that's about what a day's production would be between Boeing, Douglas, and Lockheed, who all produced the B-17. And uh, well, they were, we were in a war we didn't want. We tried to stay out of that war. Uh, we got brought into it, we finished it, and we came home, and now we had this giant air force uh, with no enemy. Uh, so most of the B-17s were scrapped. Uh, they went to places like Walnut Ridge or Kingman, Arizona, and were cut up. And you know, during the war, people were recycling already. They were, they were rations, they were turning in scrap metal. So now it was time to go back to peacetime and to, to reclaim some of that. Uh, the B-17s that do survive were able to do so because either they were, they were bought for different reasons um, or found different ways to continue working. Uh, and they were bought for surprising amounts. Uh, the Memphis Bell, the famous airplane with the documentary, was bought by the city of Memphis for $350. Uh, it flew to Memphis, become a war memorial, and of course now it's in Dayton, Ohio at the Air Force Museum under restoration. Um, the aluminum overcast, that's it right there. Uh, Post-war, it, uh, it flew different missions. Uh, it was basically hauling oil, uh, beef. Uh, it, at one point, it was converted to a fire ant sprayer. And uh, then it was bought by a gentleman who donated it to the EAA. And uh, when it first came to EAA, it looked like that. It basically had a, uh, it was called Chief Oshkosh, and it just had a sort of a, a somewhat military scheme on it, but it had no equipment in it. You could go in through that back door and look actually up into the nose. I mean, there was, there was nothing in it. And uh, through the years, we've been able to piece together military equipment and return it as pretty close to what it would have looked like in 1945 when it came off the assembly line. So a lot of people ask, why does the EAA fly a B-17? You know, we're an organization that, that basically champions the cause of experimental airplanes and home builds. Uh, why do we do that? Well, we, we do it because it, it's important to aviation history. And aviation history, aviation history is important to sparking that interest in aviation to start with. Um, we get young kids interested with this airplane. When we go to an airport, it's suddenly no longer a fenced off piece of land you're not welcome at. It's, no, this has come be part of your EAA uh, chapter, which is what you guys obviously do here. Uh, come out to the airport, this is a place where stuff happens. Uh, we also have to honor these, the heroes. Uh, unfortunately, schools aren't teaching it. They don't have, unfortunately, the resources to teach World War II as in-depth as they could. So that falls on us a bit. But one of the gentlemen that uh, we're really proud of is a gentleman by the name of Scott Taylor, who I actually just talked to on a drive up here. Uh, Scott was, the, uh, was in the first graduating class from our Air Academy. His grandfather was killed in a B-17 over Europe, and he never met him. But through the telling of the stories from uh, uh, his father and some pictures, he loved the B-17 uh, and went on to be Air Force Academy, graduated there, and now flies F-15 Eagles. Uh, that's his wife in the photo who's also an F-15 Eagle pilot. And uh, they guarantee me that they definitely argue about who drives to dinner, so. <laughs> hey, Chris. Yes. Can you just say this for about five minutes? No problem, no problem, I can, I can do that. Uh, anniversary flight here, we had Mr. Terabula fly with us. Uh, really, we're excited to have him up. We uh, 
took uh, his wife, Jo, and uh, uh, he proposed to her through a telegram when he was overseas. She said yes, and he came home to, to, to marry her. It was her wedding anniversary. We took them for a flight, and we led her out to the airplane, loaded her in, and we go to load, hit him in, and he goes, well, I'm not getting in that thing. And uh, you know, he had been a ball turret gunner for 25 missions, and he said on our last mission, uh, we were shot up coming back with a wounded airplane, and I asked God to get me out of this. I'll never fly again. And uh, so he said, uh, I did just that. I never, uh, never flew again. So, well, good. Now you guys can hear me. So, <laughs> um, Freedom Flight uh, was one where we put all 10 crew members back together, and that was quite a hunt. Uh, we had a full crew, bombardier all the way back to tail gunner. And uh, that was kind of, that was pretty amazing. This is probably the proudest thing I'll ever get to do in my career. Uh, get to call these guys at home, and we would hunt for bombardiers and navigators. It was really tough to try to track any down. And as a matter of fact, I got the nickname of Elwood in the, at the office because you would call these guys and this old gentleman would come to the phone, this old voice. And uh, you would ask, is this you know, Bob Schneider? And you, is this the Bob Schneider that was a bombardier in World War II? And you'd, you know, they'd say yes. And, and I'd say, well, we're putting a crew back together. And uh, they sort of uh, assimilated that to the Blues Brothers that we're putting the band back together. And uh, so, but you know, then you'd start to hear the years peel off and you'd start to hear this young guy kind of come back and where are we going, you know? And uh, so we get him up there. Now, a little bit of background real quick. I'm from Pittsburgh. We get spring in March. Uh, Wisconsin does uh, winter a little bit longer. You guys have winter part two. And uh, so April was this flight was scheduled for, it snowed. And I said, well, we had open air Jeeps and stuff that were supposed to take them over to the plane. I said, there's no way they're ever gonna bring the Jeeps out. These guys aren't gonna wanna ride in there anyway. So we had a heated van ready for them. And um, the Jeeps still showed up and these guys still wanted to ride in the Jeeps. And they said, it wasn't warm in England either. And they, they started to, a couple of them tried to pile onto one Jeep and like sit on the hood. And it's like, no, I'm, this, I'm gonna get fired you know, if you guys fall. So, uh, but we were able to get them up. And what was really interesting was, um, you know, something I didn't think of. It was 30 degrees in the airplane when we went flying that day. And when they came back, they all, uh, they said, thank you. They, you gave us back our airplane. They said, anytime we'd been in near a B-17, it's summertime. It's air show season. And they said, today we went flying. We could see our breath. And, you know, and they said, that's, that's how it was in that airplane. I promise I'll wrap it up with, the, uh, with last, these last two here. They're pretty short. Uh, you guys may remember we flew over Lambeau Field with the B-17. Um, I'm a Steelers fan, but even I have to say that was pretty cool to fly over Lambeau. Um, something we didn't know the next day, that was on a Sunday. Uh, the next day, we get a note uh, and an email uh, that said, thank you. And we open it up and here, two blocks north of the field, uh, there was a top turret gunner from the 398th Bomb Group being laid to rest. And his family was just laying him to rest, and we come by at 1,000 feet. And our airplane is a 398th painted airplane, so they had the triangle W's and everything on it. Uh, we had no idea. That's once again something that we couldn't have planned. Um, Staff Sergeant Zerbacher was on Freedom Flight. We were actually able to work with the Air Force to give him a Purple Heart, which he never received. Uh, that was pretty uh, incredible to get a chance to do that with him. And, you know, I told you that I was going to tell you a story about that jacket, and I'll tell you this in closing. Um, the, my first media flight ever. Um, those jackets took on a different meaning. The, the green jacket with the embroidery on the back. Uh, I had uh, set up a media flight. We had one World War II veteran and nine members of the media. It was gonna be a really cool event. And uh, that was the day Justin Bieber got caught with a monkey in, his air, in the airport or whatever he was doing. And all the media didn't, none of them came out. They didn't wanna, they didn't wanna cover it. One newspaper guy did. And uh, we had this veteran who we told we were gonna take flying and we had uh, one newspaper guy and his family, in the, the veteran's family. So we said, well, we're gonna, take, we're gonna do the right thing. We're taking this guy up. And we did, a, we did a flight with him. And we took the whole family with him, and they all got to fly together. That was on a Thursday. On Monday, uh, his son called and ordered the jacket. And uh, he wanted it express shipped overnight, which was like 65 bucks to ship it. And I, I was like, you sure you wanna do that? You know, it's, it's expensive to do this. And he says, well, yeah, he says, it was, uh, it was something I'll never forget. He goes, my father, we all got to fly with him. Uh, he had a notebook that he would write down all his missions in. And he said, that night we're at dinner. We all went to dinner. And he says he took out his notebook and he wrote, you know, 26 mission. Uh, I flew with my family. And he said that night uh, he went home and he passed away. So uh, the jacket we're ordering is we want to bury him in, in your B-17 jacket. So um, 
You know, that, that strikes home for us. That's, that's what we're doing with this airplane. Uh, we're preserving a legacy for these gentlemen. It's something so important that they did at the age of when they were graduating high school that years later, that's how they want to be remembered and they want history to remember them. So if you get a chance to come out and, and see our airplane, I, I, I could talk all day and I don't want to do that because I know there's another speaker after me, but I really appreciate you coming here and, and sharing some time with me. I'll hang out afterwards if anybody has any questions, but, but thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Okay, you can throw coffee at me now, I have unplugged, so.